Okay, let's do this for the first time. There exist certain types of people out there that no matter the cause, no matter the time and place, it doesn't really matter what the circumstance is because there are individuals who can say they will be there since they believe it's their responsibility to show up for what they believe is right. They're what I like to call heroes. My hero, your hero, I am a hero? What even is a hero? Well, a hero is someone who we can all call for in a time of need despite anything and everything. They're the ones we look up to when all hope is lost, and just when you think the fire inside you is about to be smothered away, they're there to set a light inside you that could never be put out. The title of being a hero of today is so broad but for all the appropriate reasons. You see, in this day and age, you don't need to wear a cape to seem super or have a secret identity to feel the pressure of those around you to be lifted because of who and what you are. I mean, sure, it helps keep your privacy intact, but I think at this point in time, we've come to a state where most people circulating the globe have realized that these heroes that are so much more than us are really just like you and I. We think that just because these heroes have super strength or can transform or even swing across the city with that sticky stuff that swings like rope, that they're so much more than us. But the truth of the matter is that they're really no different from people like you and I. They get up, they eat, they go to class, they have girl problems. They're ultimately human. So you might be asking yourself at this point, what kind of heroes are we even talking about then? Being a hero is such a broad term, but I think focusing on the ones that I and many of you can relate to in somewhat of a personal level is where I think this video can really go beyond. I'd say one that sets up a great example of a hero that not only many of you are familiar with, but is the composing factor of what it means for a hero to go beyond. The one that tells us with his name that you can do it too. His name is Deku. I saw this timid, worthless boy trying to save a life. It inspired me to act too. Izuku Midoriya, or better known by his superhero alias, Deku, is a young and ambitious kid who I would have never guessed turned out to be the character he is now within the current running state of the manga. Deku, like many heroes, started his journey as any other ordinary kid, of admiring the heroes he looked up to. For years, he was powerless, or I guess in this case, corkless, with no identity of who or what he would become. Discovering his identity is probably where a lot of people like myself found the story so captivating because we've seen this done before with other western heroes but never in the case of an anime and manga, at least the ones done as good. The realization that Deku has early on that heroism is more about actions and values rather than what special quirk you could be given by birth, it kind of shows this idea of what it means to be a hero so quickly in the story. And we see how prevalent that is because of how quickly Deku is able to act on his feet just within the first episode and chapter of the series. Seeing how we go from Quirkless to One For All just within a short span of time, not because Deku is some sort of chosen one, that spot was clearly meant for Mirio, also known as Lemillion, or as I like to call him, the janitor of My Hero Academia, cause you know, he's kind of washed up now. But Deku inheriting the power of One For All marked not only as a pivotal point in his own life, but for his mentor and predecessor All Might as well. All Might had his own candidate being of course Lemillion, but acted out of instinct, just like Deku did in which set the stage for the story of My Hero Academia to begin. My Hero Academia isn't a series I could call a personal favorite of mine, but when it comes to the tropes of being a hero, it does it in a way most manga could really only hope to achieve, with each and every arc showcasing what it means to truly go beyond what's humanely possible. I think it's displayed within every arc and season of the series that Deku specifically is this hero that others look at and just question why he's doing what he does. In the first season, you see him going beyond ends meet, breaking pretty much every bone in his body to be able to make it into UA High. 
in Season 2 with his fight with Shoto, not only is he fighting for the sake of the tournament, but also for the sake of helping Shoto's own personal fears and resentments. In Season 3, Deku's fight with Muscular is considerably the most vital breaking point for his character thus far because for a split second, there's a moment where just as much as the audience is wondering, Deku himself couldn't even fathom what he was about to pull off, which resulted in the fatality of Muscular with not 100, not 1000, but 1 million percent of his effort. I could really go on with a continuation of arcs and seasons in the series to present Deku's triumph of heroism, but if this wasn't good enough to show you that Deku's might is one of a true hero, I really don't know what is. He's just one of those characters that transfers over so well from the typical western hero stereotype and applying it into the anime and manga format. But what if for a moment we flip the script and point our fingers at those who do exactly the opposite? The ones who take inspiration from the traits of which embodies an anime protagonist. And I think I just know the right person. Or should I say... Alien? Ben 10, along with many other cartoon heroes, carry the weight of inspiration from a plethora of anime. And while Ben Tennyson isn't necessarily a direct innovation of certain anime characters, there's definitely a lot of characteristic traits of the likes of many anime protagonists, specifically shonen protagonists. And if you think about it, at its core, shonen stands for young boy. And typically, a lot of these cartoon heroes all really start their adventure from their youth and often they begin from the stance of immaturity to responsibility. Ben 10 in its own original series does just that. Ben discovers the Omnitrix and is now suddenly thrusted into a world even he couldn't have never imagined in his wildest dreams. And since he found this piece of alien technology designed by a little alien bug thingy? I forgot the race of what it's called, but while that's actually pretty cool, Ben isn't necessarily really fit for this amount of responsibility that he has to grasp. And throughout the series, Ben faces the consequences of his actions, whether it's inadvertently causing chaos with any of his alien forms or putting himself and even others in danger. These experiences force him to kind of confront the impact of his choices and gradually become more responsible as he grows older. Which brings us into Alien Force. Alien Force is my personal favorite interpretation of the franchise, but it's also the one I felt the most connected to because this is kind of where you start to see the real growth in Ben's character. This is kind of where he starts to befriend those who were previously enemies in the original series, and you start to see the obligation of his actions become more and more significant. The depth and maturity of Ben's motives go really well with the task of wielding the Omnitrix, and it's because of these motives and learning what's really at stake with in the series as it goes on, it causes him to push past anything that's physically possible, even for the likes of any of his alien forms. Kind of even to the point of losing the Omnitrix and having to confront Vilgax head on without any source of quote unquote power towards the end of the Alien Force series. But think about it, these are moments that make a character really move forward. When all hope is lost, Ben goes to those who gave him faith and it reminds himself of everything he's been through and what's really at stake that pushes his spirit beyond what's alienly possible. And you know, now that I think about it, there's also another alien superhero that I can't believe I forgot to mention. It's funny because when you look at everything that's happened so far in the show, when you look at him and then his name, he's practically... Mark Grayson, known by most people as Invincible, is a character and show that I've been falling immensely in love with ever since the beginning of its release. And since season 2 just wrapped, I didn't think I would be as invested as I was previously, even with a few month break we had within the middle of the season. Which kind of resulted in a lot of people that at least I know, falling behind with the show and going as far as to even lose interest. But as for me, I was as excited as ever to hop right back into what Invincible had to offer. Invincible Season 2 showed me what the toll of perseverance can have on you, when you're not only a hero but a person who wants nothing more than to be just like everyone else. Mark kinda struggles with the complications of, let's just say, 
daddy issues? On top of not only having to battle with the confliction of his father, he has to also basically help raise his intergalactic child, which also happens to be Mark's own blood-related brother. And if that wasn't already enough, on the outset of just trying to be invincible, Mark has to struggle with the idea of keeping his relationship with his girlfriend intact. And it's not like what he's going through emotionally isn't what we all would go through. He's completely valid in that sense. However, it's because of the fact that he is a superhero, he has to deal with something that not many people, but what most heroes have to kind of go through when trying to be in a relationship with someone who in Mark's eyes, and catch this if you can, is his Cinderella of a partner, but in reality is just as vulnerable as a glass slipper without the canon of being a hero. Even so, if that wasn't enough girl problems, by the end of the season, he has to grasp the truth that one of his best friends, Adam Eve, has an, I'm to presume, is and always will be in love with him. But most importantly, where season two shines the most in my opinion, is the final battle across the multiverse with Angstrom. Mark deals with the actuality that even that Angstrom is blinded by rage, pride, and really just only seeing red because like come on out of all the 14 million 605 possibilities that he saw the one actually being a decent human being is the one you're trying to kill like if pride wasn't the devil i don't know who is to be honest but what's even more severe is that mark snaps this is one thing he wished to never become his father or at least how he sees himself and he ends up completely and utterly killing Angstrom, leaving him to die somewhere across space and time. My family! Ah! It is then where in this moment alone, going beyond was probably pushing it, and is something that everyone around Mark believes that he isn't who he thinks he is, but he can only respond with, you oh, weren't there. I wanted to kill him, but I didn't know if I could. <laughs> I can save oh, lives. You did. You saved a ton of them. Invincible Season 2 showed me that while it's Mark's actions are heroic, the dichotomy of his character can sometimes affect the person he sees himself as. That in which is inevitable to come out from time to time, being the only thing that's more invincible than his skin, is the vulnerability and defenselessness of his state of mind. So from the outside, regardless of his friends and those close around him, I can't wait to see where Mark's character goes in season 3. Will we travel down the route of a hero or a menace? Wait, where have I seen that before? Oh yeah. Spider-Man is my favorite superhero, and like many of you would agree, I think we all know why. He's the definition of what makes a coming of age hero so great, going through the same acts of his story in every single timeline that exists, calling it a canon event. Peter Parker's discovery of finding himself, no matter the version of the character that's being presented, is always something I'll never get tired of because of how well the format is set up for his character that's being portrayed. And look, I know some people will have mixed opinions on who is the best interpretation of the character, but I think for the majority, we can all say there's something special about each one of them that makes them stand out. Even when I ask my friends, and yes, I have friends, for the most part, they always say they're pretty equal in their eyes. While I think that's kind of a boring answer, I also think that's just because they're all so astounding in their own way, that it's actually that close of a comparison. It's like if you graphed out their stats, stats being like a metric for how you would rank them, they would all be like a 97 to a 99 overall, but I'm getting off track. It's important to note how well a character like Peter Parker and Spider-Man can set up an example throughout multiple interpretations of the character, as well as being that perfect blueprint when it comes to making a coming of age hero. His story is the preset for what all these other characters bring to the table. Not only that, but his charisma, personality, and just overall how he holds himself is taken as inspiration for all these other characters. And actually, for the video's sake, instead of breaking the story down for Peter in each iteration like I did for the rest of these characters, let's just take the key moments I think really separate and push their individual character forward beyond what their peers are capable of really. So, starting from the OG 
Toby, in my eyes, has always been the best Peter Parker. This doesn't really neglect his Spider-Man one bit, but out of all these characters, Toby's portrayal as Peter really captures the morality of his internal struggles really well, including his guilt over Uncle Ben's death and his love for Mary Jane, and just the constant battling between his personal life and being Spider-Man. I think out of everyone, when it comes to the, just the struggle of being a young adult, especially in New York City out of all places, so far, Toby has them beat by a long shot. Now, coming off of Spider-Man 3, unfortunately, we didn't get Spider-Man 4, but we got something amazing with Andrew's version in 2012. Andrew, throughout all of his films, including No Way Home, has probably had the most emphasis on loss, and for a character like Peter, that's like a huge factor towards his story. I'd say the emotional engagement with Andrew is just for whatever the reason, a primary essential to his character. I think it's just because of his connections with Emma Stone's Gwen Stacy that his love and love story with Gwen and him have and always will be more real than what I think any iteration of MJ, whether it's Kristen Stewart or Zendaya's character, ever will be compared to Gwen Stacy's love for Peter. So just seeing that play out in live action, I'd say that gives Andrew more of a realistic benefactor on top of the fact that I just think his portrayal of Spider-Man is simply more swaggier than the rest, I don't know how else I would put it, but there's just an untapped aura paired with Andrew when he plays Spider-Man, and I just think that goes without saying. And finally, with the MCU's poster boy, we have Tom. This is more than likely a hot take, but currently, I think Tom has at the very least the potential to become the best live action Spider-Man because of a couple reasons. I think one of which being is how I see Tom's version of the character, I genuinely think he's the closest person we've gotten to not only a comic accurate Spider-Man, but a cartoon one as well because both Spider-Man 98 and Spectacular are what I grew up on, and so every time I just see Tom, I not only see a really great comic accurate Spider-Man, but I also get something that takes me back to what I grew up on. Tom just has this perfect balance of a great Peter like Toby, and maybe not as much, but a bit of the exaggerated swag of Andrew's Spider-Man. I really just see the best of both worlds from Tom, honestly, and with Spider-Man 4 around the corner, having just an extreme amount of potential with that, that can also showcase a little bit of everything we know that makes Spider-Man, let alone Peter, just the perfect coming of age hero seeing the struggle we'll really have to go through following the events of No Way Home, it's already a guarantee that we're going to see elements of Tom's interpretation that we have yet to see be adapted. My view is that if we get to see more of Tom's internal struggle with nothing fancy, just his suit and his essentials really, kind of living out the struggle of New York's finest, I think it could genuinely push his character forward to where he needs to be to do all the things he's gonna need to accomplish in the upcoming Avengers films. And for those of you who don't agree, that's fine. It's just, looking back, what more do you really want? In Homecoming, it's about how Peter was too naive about the world he was getting himself into. A solid yet fun film that felt like an origin, but wasn't. Far From Home has a plethora of themes being tackled just in this film alone. You have the effect of following the events of Endgame, which had a spiral on Peter's mental state, dealing with the deception and the blurring lines between truth and illusion with Mysterio, which then led into the direct continuation with No Way Home being of course such a fun and hype movie for the fans of Spider-Man. I think for those of you who disagree, you're out of your mind. But nonetheless, it also gave us a conclusion to the trilogy that begs the question for the even further greater potential that Tom Spider-Man has to offer. So, after everything, it's become more clear that a coming of age hero really shows no limits to how much a character can really go beyond what's capable in their own story. Whether it's breaking every bone in your body or theirs to prove you have what it takes to be better, or losing that thing that makes you think it's the powers of that that defines the hero you are. It all just depends on what you make of it. And at the end of the day, these stories are here to remind us that being a hero is hard and that it should never be taken for granted. But it also should never be too frightening to never want to pick up the mantle of being a hero. The decisions we make are what pave the path for our own story. It's what makes us human. What I genuinely think truly defines a hero is not the powers they possess or the challenges they face, but rather their undying determination to do what's right. 
to stand up for what they believe in, and to inspire others to do just the same. So this isn't just for the sake of the video, but I want to end things off by telling you to always remember to be the hero of your own story. Hey, just quickly before things completely wrap up, I wanted to mention I finally have a Patreon. I know a few of you have been asking me about it, and I honestly just been kind of procrastinating on it for the longest, but it's finally here, and I think you guys would be pleased to notice that I think the tiers I have compiled compiled comprised are super cool and a little different than what you would get from most patreons so finally one last time go check out the patreon go support it i appreciate all the love and support on the channel already and if you want to support me even further the patreon will be linked at the top of the description box down below but with that i'll catch you all in the next one later